six. Normally on our family fellowships nights during this year, I've been going through Proverbs, but I noted that I just taught on Proverbs 31 on Mother's Day, and then this Sunday, as we continue the series on Be Humble or Be Humbled, we're going to be seeing several verses from Proverbs as well. And so instead tonight, I would like to camp out on one of God's precious promises it's found in Isaiah chapter 26 verses 3 and 4. In fact, let's read these verses together. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. It should say, uh, I must have grabbed the wrong translation here. You will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. Now before we break these verses down by way of observation and interpretation in order to make application to our lives, let me just remind you very quickly due to time constraints of some principles found in Hebrews chapter 4 regarding the faith rest life. Hebrews 4 is the great faith rest chapter in the Bible. It's one of my favorite chapters on the Christian life and I hope that it will be or will become one of yours as well. The key word in this chapter is the word rest, found some 11 times in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. And the rest that is being referred to is not the rest of justification before God by grace alone through faith alone, which God offers to the unsaved. But this rest is the day-to-day -day rest that God offers to believers to be entered and enjoyed by faith as they learn to trust him each step of the way, to fight their daily battles, trusting him to carry their heavy burdens, trusting him to direct their paths, trusting him to strengthen their service for Christ and also to produce his fruit through them. And this encouragement and this challenge in Hebrews 4 was sorely needed to be heard and heeded by virtue of the fact that these Hebrew Christians were being rejected by their communities, they were being persecuted by family and friends, and they were in danger of caving into the pressure and going back to Judaism. Instead of faithfully following Jesus Christ and finishing the race that God had set before them by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. And this while their eternal salvation was never in danger. Their fellowship with the Lord was. Their spiritual growth was in danger. Their fruitfulness for Christ now was in danger, as well as their future <coughs> reward at the judgment seat of Christ. And so in Hebrews chapter 4, principle number one is that God is offering a life of inner peace and rest, which is available to all believers, but is entered only by some. Verse 1 says, therefore, since a promise remains, it's still available, of entering his rest. This is a rest that God has provided. Of inner peace, a freedom from worries and anxieties, a sense of confidence and inner stability. Since a promise remains of entering his rest, <coughs> let us fear, be concerned, Lest any of you believers seem to have come short of it, you, you've missed it, or maybe you assumed it's too late to enter in. And God wants us to know that it's still available. You may have blown it yesterday, believer, but it's still available today. Principle number two, the provisions and promises of God must be known and mixed with faith in order to profit you. Verse 2 says, for indeed the gospel, the gospel of this rest, was preached to us in the first century, as well as to them, the Exodus generation. But the word, this, these promises of rest, which they heard, did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. You see, God's promise plus our faith equals entering or enjoying God's rest. Now, this was true when you were saved, 
You took God at his word. You believed that Jesus Christ, God who had become a man, died for you and rose again. And you took God at his word and you entered into salvation rest. As a result, you now were identified with Christ and you could enter into the rest that you are accepted in the beloved. And now there are many promises for you as a believer so that you would walk by faith and not by your feelings and not after your flesh. And instead of believing Satan's lies, you would take God at his word and enter into his rest each and every day. Principle number three is another's failure to enter into God's rest does not have to stop you from entering into today. And as he makes reference of the Exodus generation that failed to enter, as he made reference to the fact that in Canaan land there was a failure as well, and David had to mention it again, the writer of Hebrews wants us to know that today it's still available. God is offering to you as a believer today the faith rest life. And you know, I begin many days by talking to the Lord about that and just say, Lord, thank you that you are offering me today the faith rest life in which you will fight my battles, you will carry my burdens, you will direct my path, you will strengthen my service, you will produce fruit in my life as I just focus on you and walk by faith and dependence upon you. It's still available, and it's still to be enjoyed. Principle number four, the rest God provides is still available for God's people and is completely provided by God's grace. Verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for who? For the people of God. For he who has entered his rest, this is the rest God has provided, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. And this was true in your salvation. You ceased from your works, and you placed your work in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And the Lord says, now I want you to rest by faith in me to take care of your situations, and even rest by faith in me to mature you and enable you and even direct you according to the word of God. Principle number five is entering God's available rest requires decisions to trust God's word repeatedly and to approach boldly via prayer the throne of grace in faith. And you see, one of the reasons people don't enter rest is they don't know the word of God. They don't know the promises of God or they're not casting their cares on the Lord for he cares for them. And so briefly, these are five principles that hopefully will be better cemented into your thinking as you learn to mix the principles and promises of God with faith. As we think of those promises, you should be turned to Isaiah chapter 26. And we will consider now verses 3 and 4. Now, whenever you're examining a passage, you always must look at its context. And the context of this promise involves a song that will be sung in the future by redeemed Israel. You see that if you begin in verse 1, you will see that he's making reference to a song. And as a result, the redeemed of Israel will sing this in the future. But in this passage, in verses 3 and 4, we find what I call a transdispensational principle or promise. This is a promise that is true in every dispensation, in every age. You see, what I'm going to look at here, we just saw in Hebrews 4, about this rest that God has provided for you as a believer. And you know, unfortunately, many believers live in panic palace. Many believers are just fraught with anxiety and worries, and they're just laden with guilt and anxiety about the future, and they're not enjoying inner peace and inner joy. They're always trying to just make it all work, and they're, they're just trying to create this instead of entering into it. You see, the fulfiller and subject of this promise is God. Again, in Isaiah chapter 26, 
and verse 3, it says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You see, it's God who has to fulfill this promise. You don't crank out this peace. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the result of self-effort. He is the subject of this. He is to be the focus of this. This is not something you create. This is not something you produce. This is something he will produce in your life. Thirdly, we see the content of this promise is that you will keep him in perfect peace. You will keep him in perfect peace. Now, the word will keep means to guard from danger, to preserve and watch over. It was actually used of fortifications fortifications being bombarded by an enemy. You see, this reminds me of the principle or promise in Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall walk, guard mount is the idea, around your heart in Christ Jesus. You see, God will keep you in a condition of perfect peace. And you know in the Hebrew, the word is shalom, shalom. <coughs> peace, peace. Peace upon peace. Complete peace. Translated, perfect peace. This is internal peace, not external peace. All hell may be breaking out around you, as it were, but internally, you can have peace. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your conflict, regardless of your pressure, your decisions, your age level, your gender, or your stage of growth, this is a promise God is offering to you. And he knows exactly what you're going through tonight. And he's offering to you his perfect peace. Let's see, panic palace, perfect peace. Which one would you rather enjoy? Now, the condition of this promise is whose mind is stayed on you. And notice, the mind emphasizes what you are thinking. Because God is always more concerned about what you are thinking than what you are doing. Now, the word stayed is an interesting one. It literally means leaning upon. Leaning upon you. You see, if you're going to enjoy perfect peace, you have to lean upon the Lord. You know, I can remember years ago, a believer told me he spent a night in the hospital. And he repeated this promise over and over again. God, you said you'll keep me in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because I trust in you. No, no, whose mind is stayed on you. That's where he stopped. And he said it was a horrible night. I had no peace. Well, it's because while he was repeating the part of this promise, he wasn't fulfilling the condition. Whose mind is stayed on you, who's leaning on you. And that's why the fifth part of this promise is the appropriation of it. The appropriation of this promise and this perfect peace is because he trusts in you. And the Hebrew word is batak. It means to trust in, to rely on. You see, a promise is of no value to you personally unless you trust the Lord with it. And this particular Hebrew word spoke of two wrestlers and one picking the other one up like you would in a head spin and slamming them on the mat. And what God is saying is whatever decision, whatever trial, whatever circumstance, you take it and you just rely on the Lord and you cast it on the Lord. You're saying, Lord, you have promised this, and I'm believing you about it. I'm trusting you about it. You see, you don't find peace by looking for peace. You find peace by relying on the Lord and then letting him give you that peace in whatever problem you're in. Take that problem and slam them on the Lord 
as it relates to your marriage, as it relates to your kids, as it relates to your singleness, as it relates to your job, as it relates to your witness or ministry. Slam it on the Lord. He wants to carry it for you. He is for you. He loves you. His grace is sufficient. But he won't carry it for you if you persist in wanting to carry it yourself. And he'll let you shrink. He'll let you drill yourself in a hole so that you look like a pretzel. And he'll say, are you tired yet? Are you willing to turn it over to me yet? Are you willing to slam it on me yet? No, no, I got a few more plans. A little. Well, go ahead. Keep drinking the Maalox by the quart instead of the perfect peace. And so having explained God's promise in verse 3, we now have the exhortation to faith rest in it in verse 4. And the desired response is to simply trust. Verse 4 says, trust. That's the first word. Trust. He just told you to trust in verse 3, to enter into the perfect peace. Now he exhorts you, trust in the Lord forever. And this is in the imperative mood. This is a command. This is a necessity. This is an exhortation. You know the promise. You've heard the offer. Now apply it. Trust, and the object of your faith is in the Lord. Yahweh, Jehovah, the strong, promise-keeping God who wants to relate to you. And how often are you to do this? The duration of trust is to be forever, perpetually, over and over again, day by day, hour by hour, as it were, refusing to walk by sight in your feeling, but walking by faith, turning to the Lord, relying on him, believing his principles, faith resting in his promises, again, letting him fight the battle for you. And why should you perpetually trust in the Lord? The dogmatic reason is for in Yah, that's a shortened version of, version of Yahweh, the Lord, so it's doubly emphasized, is everlasting strength. Notice, just like peace, peace, perfect peace was mentioned earlier, Yah, Yah is mentioned here. He's trying to emphasize Cannot God keep his promises? Is God not all-powerful? Cannot God give you that perfect peace? So why don't you turn to him? Why don't you quit struggling? Why don't you quit fighting his plan or quit trying to produce? And why don't you just enter in by faith and trust in the Lord? Take whatever is really murdering you right now. Why don't you cast that on him? Why don't you trust him with it? And not only right now, every time it becomes it, you just trust him again. For in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. You know, the word literally means the rock of ages. It's translated oftentimes, the eternal rock. In other words, your strength your source of stability comes from the Lord. Now, if you slam something on a rock, the rock's going to handle it, right? In the same way, when you slam your problems, when you slam your decisions, when you rely on the Lord, he will carry your burdens. Like my little plaque in my study, Lord, why am I worrying about your problems? Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. Dear believer, are you enjoying that perfect peace that passes all understanding? God is waiting for you to cast your care upon him, to occupy your mind with his promises, and lean on him day by day, 
and especially at this time of need in light of the trial you're going through. And he will, in exchange for your problem, give you a peace that passes all understanding. And if you're here tonight and you've never trusted in Christ and his finished work, God is offering to you not the peace of God, but peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As he loves you. He died for you on the cross. He paid for your sin completely. He rose victorious from the grave. He ascended into heaven. And he offers to you a new life, eternal life in Christ alone. But to enter into that, you must cease trying to work for your salvation. Cease trying to impress God with what you've done. And instead, simply trust in what he has done for you. Through Jesus Christ dying for your sins and being raised again. Father, thank you again for this time in your word. What a great passage. And I just am so grateful that you are patient with us. You keep teaching us how to trust you. You bring us into situations where gnosis can become epinosis. Knowledge can become experiential knowledge that is understood and enjoyed. And we can taste and see that you are good. We can see that you carried that burden. We can see you fought that battle. We can see you directed our path. You worked things out providentially in which there is no other way to explain it but you. And in the meantime, you fill our hearts with joy and peace through faith resting in you, that we might abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, thank you for this promise and this exhortation from the Old Testament, which is just as true now as church age believers. We thank you. And Father, when we do go in panic palace, when we do lose our focus, and when we do sin against you, thank you that we can just confess it to you, claim your forgiveness, and get refocused. For we know that when Jesus Christ is not our focus, everything else is out of focus. And so may we be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We thank you now in Jesus' name. And amen.